Aloha and welcome to Cooper Union. What's happening with human rights around our world on Think Tech Live, broadcasting from our downtown studio in Honolulu, Hawaii and Moana Nui Akea. I'm your host, Joshua Cooper. And today we're looking at the most powerful weapon for Ukraine, truth. The Italians role to fight Russian aggression. And I'm so honored to be joined with Natalia, the co-founder and CEO of the Talion. Natalia, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be, to be with you tonight. Actually, your morning, our night. Yes. And truth is known as the first casualty of war. In, and in Ukraine, though, the women in the war are making sure the truth is alive and well. The Talion was born with the bold vision to create a Ukraine data battalion to inform people in conflict and the entire world with what's really happening in the senseless war. Can you share with us how you were inspired to create such an important instrument? Uh, it uh, all started from the, basically, all started on the fourth day of war. When the war started, I, I'm originally from Kiev, so I was lucky enough to escape from Kiev uh, on the first uh, night of bombing with my kids. And I went to a safe place in uh, Western Ukraine to my mom's in, and uh, for four days, you know, I was helping like, to host internally displaced people to ask uh, and to help, you know, through my international network to help to get some deliveries to Ukraine of West helmets of some, uh, you know, like food to the occupied, uh, to, the, to the territories in, in conflict. And, uh, and, and I was thinking like what I can do more. You know, when I'm still in the safe part of Ukraine at that time and how I can help. Because of my previous work, I had a tremendous network uh, abroad, living all over the world uh, because uh, I did fellowship at Stanford. I studied in Germany. I worked in Canada and I also worked as a trade minister in Ukraine. So I have this, you know, like very big network of my foreign friends. So from, from the first day of war, I started posting on my social media about like really what's going on. And every day, you know, all my friends told me, you know what, you are our source of information because what we see on major TV channels, international TV channels or foreign, you know, like TV channels or our home TV channels. Actually, we don't see those pictures. We don't see those videos that you are posting. We don't see all this information. And I was curious, like why? And, and then, one night, uh, my friend and former partner from Yes, she called me and it was like very early in the morning in Ukraine because she's living in LA and that was like five in the morning uh, in Ukraine and I just got back home from a uh, bomb shelter when I was sitting with my kids after sirens and she was calling me three times. I was like, oh my God, something should be going on. You know, like why she's calling me like three times. And she was like, okay, you know what? Switch on TV, switch on this channel, switch on this channel. Look what they are broadcasting. I mean, Ukraine is being bombed. You just posted from your picture from bomb shelter, from bomb shelter. And what we are seeing is just a nice interview from the peaceful part of Ukraine, you know, about like how people are, uh, they are just hypothesizing what they will do if, you know, like there will be like bombs flying over or there will be like, you know, like some other, uh, negative you know situation so basically and and she was like you need to change it like the world needs to see what i am seeing on your social network because people don't feel the pain they don't understand like that that's like a real war what's going on in ukraine so i started like that morning i started reaching to my friends that were working in media business and that were like my friends foreign journalists asking like what's going on why are you are showing only these pictures and they told me you know what there are no war journalists in Ukraine at that time because there were only journalists, you know, just an ordinary journalist. And because of the company's policies and because of the security regulations, they were not able to leave their hotel. And those that came to Ukraine were also not war journalists. So they could stay only in the very safe, you know, cities at that time. So basically, the war was covered from the bunkers or from the safe places. Therefore, you know, what we've seen first like four days and seven days of the war were discovered. So what we are starting to do, and they told us, you know, like I was brainstorming with them, like what we can do to change it. And they told, okay, you should create the database 
of eyewitness uh, photos and videos from the front lines of war and provide this access to foreign journalists so they can see like what's really going on. They can use these pictures or they can basically only just, you know, like what potentially, you know, see what's going on in these regions. And, and then when the war journalist would come, they could send this war journalist to this particular region and they would at least have understanding like what the situation is. So within first 24 hours, I just, you know, posted on my social media I, and I already had a team of four volunteers and within first 48 hours, we already had 100 photos and videos in the database. And we started granting access to the journalists that basically we were brainstorming with. And that's how it all started. And the idea was, look, we need the world to see what's really going on in Ukraine because we need help now. And, and it's not that it's just some fictional situation or the, like there is no war or it's only operation. They need to see that civilians are being killed, that kids are being killed and injured, that Russians are bombing and hitting not only, you know, not only a military object, that they are targeting civilian infrastructure, that they are targeting, you know, houses, that they really, you know, like kill and harm ordinary and Ukrainian people. And they are, you know, harming animals. They are, you know, brutally uh, actually shooting into elderly. So that was, that was it. That was story. And we decided we just need to go on. And the, our, our work from one side became uh, kind of easier when a lot of foreign and international channels, they send their war photographers and war journalists into Ukraine that could do the coverage. But even with them, you know, there were so few of them in Ukraine. And there were so many dangerous places that even those war journalists could not go. You know, if it's like frontline and the city is being occupied, the only source of information for all the journalists and for also for all politicians and decision makers all over the world, in foreign governments, in international organizations, are only those videos and photos because that's that's you know how you can get information about people living in occupied for example now in occupied Kherson it's from the eyewitness you know like videos and photos and from some you know like intelligence information so so basically we we continued working on that and uh, and we managed to create the largest independent uh free public and what is most important uh for us is aggregated database so we are aggregating photos and videos from different sources and we are making life of uh, journalists politicians researchers easier because we are uh actually sorting these videos into groups so they are all divided into dates they are all divided into regions and they also have tags you know like what you have and they will and they also have description on like what's going on on the video and they have also the uh name source where we took it if we can so we divide them into uh like trusted information that's the videos and photos that we took from official websites of the ukrainian government and government agencies we have uh, so-called uh, information it's like official then we have trusted information and that's the sources that we use for example from ukrainian media that we can name and we also have category of uh, videos that are not not verified and we just you know in indicate the sources source where we took it but we are not we are just you know like letting everybody know that they need to do their work in terms of verification of this video so, uh, so that's what we have. It's very helpful. And we can see that the Italian ensures the truth is an important homegrown weapon in fighting the Russian aggression and the disinformation campaigns that have been targeting Ukraine from even before the war started. So that's what makes it such a valuable tool. Yes, I agree with you. But uh, we, you know, like we, we cannot stop. We are working every day and like our database is increasing. But what we what we've experienced is that when when there are a lot of like much more war correspondents in Ukraine now and the foreign journalists and the people they have access also to this official video, we recently introduced a new program which is called eyewitness database. 
we have uh, around more than 70 eyewitnesses, verified eyewitnesses, that uh, if uh, any journalist or think tank or uh, politician would like to hear their statement, we can put them in touch with those people. And those people are ready to go public and they're ready to tell their story. Because it's very important for us, you know, not only to show the video, but also to provide people that can be witness that can witness, you know, like what they experienced and what they've seen or what they've gone through. You know, we have witnesses that went through filtration camps in uh, Russia in order to get out from Mariupol. We have witnesses that lost their close ones. We have witnesses that lost their business, you know, because the Russian bomb hit the production capacity. Uh, we, it's, uh, you know, it's like those, like we have witnesses that lost their kids. And it's, uh, it's uh, you know, it's, uh, it, 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 it's, it's hard to talk about the stories, but the only way for us to tell the truth about the war in Ukraine is to bring into the loop those people and to show their perspective on what Russia is doing to civilians, to Ukrainian families, and to show, you know, like how horrible, I mean, it's uh, like all the situation is and what the atrocities Russia and Russian army uh, are doing in Ukraine. No, and, and the documentation from the people's perspective sharing exactly what's going on is so powerful. And as you said, it's painful, but then it also gives people a taste of what's really happening as opposed to maybe a sterile version or some that's really not sharing all of the intense suffering that people are facing on a moment by moment, every hour for the last 158 days. And I think that's probably the most powerful part of the Talion, as well as it's following a rich model of witness created by Peter Gabriel to make sure that video can be made and could be made by the people who are being impacted directly on the front lines and then sharing that directly with people around the world who also want to know what's happening because that's what's crucial especially as this continues on longer and longer the sad part is as you said how people are surviving camps how people are being their lives are being shattered with constant bombing and just being able to see that footage raw allows people to experience what you're sharing which is why it's so crucial, especially as you also begin to share it with policymakers, that it's then a tool as well to be able to guide people and governments to make better decisions on what's really needed on the ground. Maybe you can share how the information has been used. Yes, and uh, you, you, just, you just raised a very important point, is that a lot of politicians and a lot of decision makers, global leaders around the world, they're taking their decisions usually based on the briefs like written documents or written papers provided to them by the intelligence services, by their uh, special agencies that are working with Ukraine. And they, you know, like not all these papers could just show the suffering that Ukrainians are going through and the urgency of providing some uh, help or assistance to Ukraine. So we are using our database and we are using the witnesses in order to show to foreign and global uh, top leaders and decision makers the urgency of providing help to Ukraine. And the latest one that we had, we just recently were uh, helping to organize an exhibition in US Senate uh, organized by uh, Ukrainian embassy and uh, the Italian and a few other think tanks and organization in US where we feature pictures of uh, two Ukrainian photographers, one of which unfortunately has been shot to death by Russians, Max Levin, and he was just executed with, uh, you know, like with the press sign on, on him and other, other things. And, and we were featuring these pictures that just to show the level of suffering that Ukrainians are going through in order for you know US senators to to understand like what's going on in Ukraine, not only on brief. Thanks God we have this level of support in US that we have now and a lot of US senators already been to Ukraine. 
So like what they are seeing in the pictures is not that they haven't like heard about, but still we need to keep attention to Ukraine issue all over the world in order to foreign, let the foreign government to help us to help ourselves. Because we are not asking, you know, just like come to Ukraine and fight for us. No, we are just saying, please help us to help ourselves by sending weapons, financial assistance and humanitarian assistance. That's what, what we are talking. We will continue, like this exhibition is just a start, a launch event for a number of other exhibitions all over the US in order to show in different states what's really going on in Ukraine and uh, to keep fighting the war fatigue because that's what we're hearing that a lot of people are giving up on Ukraine because they say we have a lot of problems at home. We have a lot of internal issues. We have a lot of local issues around. But I just want to remind everybody, and that's one of the purpose of this exhibition, that this war, it's not only about Ukraine. Ukraine is now fighting for the whole global democratic world because it's, it's fight for global democracy. It's not only fight for Ukrainian independence or for our future. Fight for global future and it's fight for global value. And every person that believes in democracy should not give up on Ukraine and should still stand up for Ukraine and help, you know, like to help us to fight. Oh, the Italian is definitely a significant element of the current campaign to ensure freedom and to make sure that the Italian illustrates how women are leading and taking an active role in defending Ukraine, but also forging a freedom, a future of freedom of expression information around the world. Because that's really a larger campaign that also exists of the disinformation by autocratic regimes to try to sow division and also make sure that there is not the unity that we've been able to see and have maintained so far in the movement for democracy, human rights, justice, and freedom inside Ukraine. Yes, uh, you're right. And I think that the women angle is very important because 75% of, of the Italians whole team are women. Uh, uh, most of them are mothers and wives. Uh, some of them are, are even, you know, like they have grandchildren. So basically what, what, what we are doing and what we are fighting for, we are fighting for the future of our kids. We're not fighting for our future. Some of the women are still in Ukraine and that's their decision. They decided to stay to back up their men. Some women are uh, left the project that are in uh, and went to, to Ukrainian mm -hmm. army. Some women are abroad because they left in order to protect their family and their kids and elderly ones. Some women were abroad and got back to Ukraine. So it's, uh, you know, I think that the power of uh, women voice all over the world is very important because if other women globally would support Ukrainian women, it would show up that women voice voices matter. And it's, 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 it's a global fight for future. And it's also a global fight for women rights and women empowerment. Because what Russia is trying to do is they are trying not only to diminish and destroy global democratic value, but among inter alia, they are trying also to destroy the, you know, like the global understanding that women rights matters and women empowerment matters because what what the, all the all the crimes that they are that they are actually committing in Ukraine against Ukrainian women, it's just about you know diminishing the role of women and actually punishing Ukrainian women for being independent and not being like you know like a lot of women, a lot of generally women in Russia in their you know like far away, far away and small cities. So it's a, it's again it's a fight for for part of democracy, which is women's rights. And I'm happy that we have, that our team is uh, notwithstanding all the problems that Ukrainian women are now facing, you know, and, they, and there are a lot of problems because a lot of people are internally displaced. Some people are living, you know, so that part of the family are living in destroyed houses. Some are living in destroyed apartments. 
kids are doing online schooling and you need always to go to the bomb shelter to be a Ukraine. If you go, went abroad, you are basically forceful refugee because it was not your intention, you know, to become a refugee. You just like happen to be a refugee and need to settle in, in, in totally, you know, different country with your kids and settle your life there. And notwithstanding all these problems and all these issues, uh, Ukrainian women are fighting. Some are fighting on the front line, some are fighting on their own front line. So our front line is informational front line. And all our women are working. They are taking care of their kids and elderly because men stayed in Ukraine or men are engaged in more dangerous volunteer assignments. And they are also volunteering. So it's, uh, you know, it's even like the situation is even worse than in COVID times because a lot of people were saying that in COVID times women were doing two shifts. But in Ukraine, the women are doing three shifts because they are still volunteering. And, uh, and like what is, what is very important for me that uh, uh, it's uh, Ukrainian women are not giving up. They are still fighting and uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, this fight continues and they are not losing face. And, uh, and I think that it's very important for all of us. This fight is very important part of our lives now. It is. And the, the women waging the information war is absolutely crucial. And as you described, the multi-levels of what women must face due to the war, plus also COVID, plus all the elements that we find ourselves in. That's why I think this female-founded initiative on the front lines is really so exciting, but it's also organizing an entire movement of women around the world, uniting together to make sure that all people can live in peace. And what you document is what women face, and that doesn't always make the, the headlines. And I think sharing those stories then mobilizes people to be more involved and see what we can all do to support this feminist female founded initiative. I agree. And uh, I think that, you know, like we will keep fighting and we will keep developing our database and uh, bringing attention to what's going on in Ukraine in uh, like through our advocacy program, because we are on the mission and our mission is to help Ukraine to win this war and we will do whatever it takes, you know, like to help Ukraine to, to win this war. Like we will do it with our database, we will use, do it with our interviews, we will do it with the eyewitness statements, we will do it through participation in major events and telling the truth what's going on. We will do it by asking, you know, our foreign audience to donate and to help Ukraine through different initiatives. And we will also, and we're also partnering with a lot of other Ukrainian projects that are also working on the front line on the informational front line, because we believe that if we are united, we have more power. And it's not that like there could not be too much truth, you know, if 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 we just tell more truth to the world and we'll tell like more what's going on and there are more voices to be heard, then like the voices become louder and people like just can't ignore it or people need to to react. So uh, we work every day with other projects and trying to create different type of partnership in order to make actually the world see and hear what's going on in Ukraine. And now with the coverage of major international channels having their war correspondents in Ukraine, the coverage on uh, top TV channels and newspapers uh, is pretty uh, much different from what we experienced during first week of the war. And we have uh, much more, you know, like good coverage from the front lines and from the uh, atrocities side. But we still believe that more could have been sad and can be sad. So we will be working to bring to the world the full picture of what's going on to, in Ukraine from the first day of war till today and through the whole geography, through the whole country and covering all the regions and providing all information and eyewitnesses from all over Ukraine and that went through different situation and using our uh, witnesses and photos and videos actually 
to push global decision makers and top leaders to take the decision that they need to take in order to preserve the world. And it's probably even more valuable as well when the war concludes so that we actually have an accurate record of what happened when you look at maybe the UN Human Rights Council Commission of Inquiry to hold accountable, as well as the potential war crimes that are being committed on a daily basis, that this information will then be able to set up in a way and be used for tools to make sure that it deters future dictators from doing such actions because there could be accountability for those war crimes and crimes of aggression that they commit against uh, the people of Ukraine. Yes, I, I agree with you here because our, uh, our next potential, uh, our next potential project is collecting the uh, evidences of the war crimes because what we have as of today is just a collection of videos and photos that could prove the massive amount of these atrocities but we will work we will work more in the nearest future with potentially with some foreign partners that have experience of collecting uh, similar uh, you know like evidences from the from the war zones in order to start collecting the evidences of this war crime uh, and in order to punish those that were you know giving orders to shoot at civilians for punishing those that were raping Ukrainian women, killing Ukrainian kids. Because you are right, it's very important for the world to know that all these atrocities will not be left unpunished. And I think that by doing so, by closing this circle, you know, creating archive of uh, like what has happened and telling the future generation like why it should not be ever you know, the world should not, not ever come to this situation. We are also working for, for future generation globally. Thank you so much, Natalia, for creating the Talion. It's really an amazing initiative. It's home to the largest free and independent open source database of photos and video footage from the senseless war against Ukraine. And we appreciate your bravery and the beauty of the importance of this project to tell the world the truth. Mahalo. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure being with you. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.